It is time for a month of madness. The entirety of July is going to be filled with non-stop action from the Tour de France on and the Tour de France fam. Coming up, our big in-depth preview of the men's race. We will have a full preview of the women's race coming closer to the start of that one. We'll go through the route, the GC contenders, the sprinters and time trialists who will be gunning for glory from the 1st of July. First up though, a montage from last year to get us all even more in the mood. It was a supporter. Tony Martin. Oh, no. It's taken out. Julien Alaphilippe makes the first move of this tour. He's done it. He's pulled it off. France has its hero back. And Julien Alaphilippe proving once again that yellow is his favourite colour of the rainbow. It had to be a classy rider that would win it at the end of the day. And there's none bigger than this man. Who were you thinking of when you crossed the line? Michael from there, of course. <laughs> it's Roglic who's down, and you can see them all on the radio. Oh, what a disaster this is for Jumbo Visma today. Mark Cavendish is going to do it! Oh, he's done it! What drama! And what a winner! So many people didn't believe in me, you know, and these guys do. Mate Mohoric makes Bahrain victorious. Teddy Pogacar is asking a question, either you're right with me or I'm, I'm going to attack you and drop you. Brilliant work, Dylan Dance. Super job. What is left to say about this band, apart from Chapeau? We are back. It is back. And Mont Ventoux plays host again. So much bad luck has rained down on Jumbo Visma, but there is light. And this man has just ignited it. Pogacar, racing on instinct with the perfect powers of recovery. He looks every bit the Tour de France dominant winner. It is all over, you might say. Oh, look at that. Mark Cavendish is boxed in here. It looks like it's going to be others. Is it? Can he retrieve the situation? Oh, it's well found out that makes the steal. Tadej Pogacar wins the Tour de France again. Tadej Pogacar taking his second successive Tour de France win and with that the polka dot and white jerseys to boot as the best climber and best young rider. Mark Cavendish came away with the points jersey as well as four stage wins that drew him level with Eddie Merckx on 34 Tour de France stage wins. Yeah, but whilst Pogacar will be back to defend his crown, Mark Cavendish looks unlikely to get a place on the Quickstep Alpha Vinyl squad this year. More on that a little bit later. Indeed. Uh, before we move on to the route, a reminder that we will have live coverage of every kilometre of every stage on GCN+. Plus. Uh, that coverage will be available to you if you're in Europe or the Asia Pacific, excluding China, Japan, Australia and New Zealand. We will have short highlights available worldwide though, and we'll also be back with the breakaway from a new state-of-the-art location, which will hopefully avert your concentration away from any dance moves that Dan and the team <laughs> are planning. So if you're not already a subscriber, we would love for you to join us in July. We would. Uh, right, onto the race, and firstly, some key info for this edition. It's the 109th Tour de France, the 24th Foreign Grand Depart, but the first time it's ever started in Denmark. Yeah, over 24 days, there'll be three rest days and 21 stages, totaling 3,328 kilometers, making it the shortest edition in 20 years. There are two individual time trials, including one on the opening day, six flat stages, one of which includes cobblestones, seven hilly stages, and six days in the high mountains. And of those six mountainous stages, five are summit finishes. So let's take a look at the route in a bit more detail. The race commences on Friday the 1st of July with a 13.2 kilometer individual time trial around Copenhagen. They start at eight meters above sea level and reach the dizzying heights of 15 meters above sea level halfway round. So I think we're safe to describe this one as flat. I reckon so, yeah. yeah. Okay, however, there are 22 corners to negotiate, so there is a technical element to it. There is. Uh, it's not your out and back route on a dual carriageway <laughs> in England somewhere, no. is it? Now, the winner of the stage will get double bubble, a stage win at the Tour de France to their name, and the first yellow jersey of this edition. Yeah, triple bubble 
actually, isn't it? Because they'll also be guaranteed the green jersey as well. True. Now, even if you don't win, it will be important for each team to have a rider placed highly on that opening stage because that will decide what position you have in the convoy of team cars behind the race. And given the nature of the following stages, there is a high likelihood you will need to service your riders. And the closer you are to the front of the convoy, the quicker you are going to be able to get to them. Very true indeed. Day two takes the race from Roskilde to Nieborg over 202 kilometers. Now this is also pretty flat, although there are three KOM points in the first half of the stage. All of them are fourth category, so in the greater scheme of things, they won't have much of a bearing on the overall winner of the King of the Mountains, but it will be on those three climbs that the first polka dot jersey of the race will be given out. It will. Now, there's also one intermediate sprint, as there is on every road stage of the race, but the main talk and worry, I guess, is about, about stage two, is the final 20 kilometers of it. Yes, and that's because 18 of those final 20 kilometers are on a bridge called the Stora Belt. Do you think I got that right? I reckon that's pretty close. Yeah, I looked it up yesterday. Almost bang on, I think. There you go. Or, or it's actual, in English, it translates as Great Belt over the Katagat Sea. Do you think I got that one right? No. no. Uh, anyway, it's very exposed to the wind, so if it's blowing from the sides to the riders, it could cause carnage. Mm. I mean, you know I love crosswinds, oh, yeah. but on this occasion I feel pretty bad for the riders because the nerves, the adrenaline, the pressure, the lack of fatigue up to that point in the race, I'm just keeping everything cross that they're going to stay safe on that bridge. Yes. Yeah, not a nice place to be in a crosswind, no. I can't imagine. Whatever happens though, there will be a sprint of sorts at the end of the stage where there'll also be 10, six and four bonus seconds for the first three riders across the line. As there will be for every road stage of this edition. The third and final stage in Denmark is 182 kilometers to Sunderborg. And whilst there's still a chance of the wind playing a role that day, there aren't any 18 kilometer long bridges on day three, that one should in theory, be a bunch sprint. The first of the three rest days then comes on Monday, the 4th of July, which is probably a good time to mention that. Just as we did for the Giro, we'll be releasing our weekly World of Cycling show on GCN Plus on the rest days of the Tour de France. So you've got something to entertain you, basically, when there is no stage to watch. Mm. Good planning, that. Isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, then on Tuesday, the 5th of July, the race arrives in France for a stage between Dunkirk and Calais. Perfect for any British fans that want to head over to watch the action close up. Now, that one's an undulating stage with six fourth category climbs. And again, the prospect of crosswinds, particularly in the closing stages, as the route hugs the coastline near Calais. Yeah, and then it's the controversial one, the Paris-Roubaix stage, Wednesday the 6th of July. The official Tour de France website describes it as bone-jarring action and also an acrobatic <laughs> challenge. I'm sure the riders could think of other ways to describe it other than those two. A lot of them would say unnecessary, I think, <laughs> yeah. if they were asked to choose a word. Uh, they don't feel cobbles. A lot of them should be part of a Grand Tour. Maybe you disagree at home, though. Let us know your thoughts in the comments section down below. Now, in total that day, there are 11 sectors of cobbles that total under 20 kilometers or just under 20 kilometers. Five of those have never been used in Paris-Roubaix or at the Tour de France before. Nice. Because of that, almost all the teams have been out to a recon ahead of the race. Love it or hate it, it is going to make for compulsive exactly, viewing. Exactly. Yeah. Even it? if you hate the prospect of cobbles in a Grand Tour, you're still going to be watching oh, that day. Absolutely. I'm in two minds about it personally. I, I love a bit of cobblestone action as I love a bit of crosswind action, but to see a rider's hard work all done through, undone through bad luck, Never great to see. No, it's, it's not, is it? Lots of work. So again, keep everything crossed. Indeed. Right, stage six actually starts in Belgium, doesn't it? At the longest of the race, at 220 kilometers. And although it's not super hilly, it's not one for the pure sprinters, because the final 1.6 k's to the finish line in Longwy are uphill as an average of 6% gradient, and there's also a short, steep kicker yeah, as well. Just before that. Stage seven is also not for the sprinters, finishing as it does up La Planche de Belfi. Well, La Super Planche de Belfi, ah, yes. isn't it? Yeah. The big one. Yeah, recently renamed, wasn't it? After they found an incredibly steep gravel climb, which they're now using into the previous finish. I really like this climb because it was first used in 2012 and it's always produced some really good racing, despite not being as severe as the Alps or the Pyrenees to come. Seven Ks at 8.7%, but that section of gravel at the top includes a section of 24%. Super. Yes. Isn't it? 
The race then heads into a fourth different country on stage eight, with the finish being in Lausanne, Switzerland. Another frustrating one for the sprinters, I think, because they might have a chance of making it to the finish in the front, but then it finishes up a 5K climb and with variable gradients. Yeah, this could be one for a breakaway, I think, when you look at it on paper. And then on stage nine, they will be in Switzerland for the most part, starting at the UCI headquarters in Aigle, doing a long loop to head back through the same place before hopping across the border back into France for a finish at Châtel le Porte du Soleil. Another one for the breakaway, potentially that potentially, one. Yeah. After the second rest of them, we will resume with a summit finish to Megève. It's a long climb at over 20 kilometers, and although the average gradient is only 4.1%, the steepest sections do come near the top. But then on stage 11, it's time for the all category climb, beyond category, uncategorizable. Not even a word, I know. Uh, but the second cat climb at the start of that stage, it looks like a mere blip compared with what's to come. We've got the infamous double punch of the Telegraph and Galibia, which is the highest point of this year's race, at 2,642 metres above sea level. Oof, and if that wasn't enough on its own, they're then faced with a long descent and then an 11K climb at 9% to the finish. It's the Col du Renan Serre Chevalier, only the second time this has ever appeared at the Tour de France. At the time when it was last used, in 1986, it was the highest ever summit finish of the it race. It was indeed. That really is a brutal day in the yeah. saddle, isn't it? Even if it is only 152 kilometers. So I'm not sure that many riders will be relishing the prospect of the following day, which goes back over the Galibier, albeit the opposite way. <laughs> That's cruel, isn't it? It's still over 20 k's long as well, isn't it? When you do it that yes. way around. It's the first of three all category climbs that day as well. The second being the Col de la Croix de Fer, which is almost 30 kilometers long. And then the final one is Alpe d'Huez, which kind of needs no introduction. It doesn't, does it? At least they'll be well warmed up <laughs> once they hit the lower slopes of the Alpe. Uh, now, I do not envy the rise one bit that day, but in terms of spectators, roadside or television, that one's going to be epic, oh, yeah. isn't it? Particularly as it lands on Bastille Day, Thursday the 14th of July. Yes, it is going to be quite the party if you're not racing, yes. isn't it? So make sure you don't miss it. There is a slight chance for the sprinters on stage 13 into Saint-Étienne, and you'd imagine they'll be trying to make the most of it, wouldn't you? Because the following day is a hilly transitional stage across the Massif Central into Monde. The roads around there are notoriously tough and grippy, aren't they? And the weather notoriously hot in the summer months. Not a stage profile that you would look at and think there'll be any massive changes on the general classification, but that one is definitely not to be underestimated. No, because it's got that really tough finish, hasn't it, that was last used in 2018, and which did see some small gaps among the GC riders. So mm. one to watch out for. On stage 15, and this one should before the sprinters, <laughs> shouldn't it? It's far from flat, but the climbs come far enough from the finish in Carcassonne that they should be there if for the finale. Yeah, and it's Carcassonne, incidentally, where the riders will spend the third and final rest day, which they will need as it's then time to take on the Pyrenees. They're eased into it reasonably gently, with stage 16 being relatively flat at the start, before a couple of first cat climbs preceded descent into the finish in Foix. Stage 16 is the shortest road stage of the race, just 130 kilometers, but the final part in particular is intense, isn't it? With four high peaks in the space of 65 kilometers. The last of those is the Perragude, eight kilometers at 8%, and it's actually the penultimate summit finish of this year's race. And the last summit finish is the following day on stage 17 to Autocam, and it's the final stage in the high mountains. Uh, the Obisk comes first, and it's the Col de Spandel, and then the Autocam, which hasn't been used since Vincenzo Nibali won there in 2014, en route to a dominant overall win. Yeah, there are then two sprinter stages in the final three days of the race. I mean, they have had to work hard to get there. <laughs> yeah, they have. <laughs> uh, but still, the first of those is on stage 19 to Cao, 188 kilometers, which are fairly flat. Stage 20 is the final day for any changes on the general classification, as it's the longer of the two individual time trials. 40 kilometers to Rocamadour. Not super hilly, but not flat either. Now, this is where the Tour de France will be decided, if it hasn't been by that point. Yeah, the whole entourage will then head to Paris for the 21st and final stage with a traditional sipping of champagne followed by the traditional laps of the Champs-Élysées. Yeah. That, you see what I did there? Yeah, I do see what you did there. Yeah. And that's all there is to it, really. 21 very easy days when you read it out <laughs> like that. Right, before we move on to the riders to watch this year, quick plug for some of our own merchandise for 
this Tour de France. We've got a special yellow hoodie, a broad range of new t-shirts, and a yellow Elite water bottle, all to celebrate the biggest bike race on the planet. Yes, and we've also partnered with the Tour de France this year to create some bespoke hoodies and t-shirts, which we're able to purchase at shop.globalcyclenetwork.com. As you can see, we are sporting we are, yeah. said merchandise. It's the first time we've done a collaboration like this, so we've quite proud about it actually Very proud about and it, particularly because yeah. we think it looks great as I well i think it looks fantastic they are limited in numbers though so it'll be first come first serve on these uh, we also like to plug our book the complete fans guide to cycling it seems to be going down really well yeah. actually that's probably because it wasn't written by either of us <laughs> but rather by esteemed cycling journalist peter cossens and there's something for everybody whether you're a die hard fan or just getting into bike racing for the first time we've also got a bundle on offer for you at the moment which you'll get a discount with if you purchase certain items together. Nice. Right, moving on, it is time to talk about the favourites. We will start with the GC riders, and when it comes to GC riders in 2022, you can only start with... Thibaut Pino, yes. <laughs> no, we'll get on to him shortly, won't we? You can only start with Tadej Pogacar, the man who has won the last two editions, and the man who has, in fact, won eight of the last nine stage races he started. It's an incredible statistic. Isn't it? Isn't it? I have to keep double-checking it to make sure it's true. Now, he's unbeaten in stage races this season, albeit he's only done three, <laughs> and there's no doubt he starts as the outright favourite. Yeah, in terms of his weaknesses, the only one we found so far is that he's not very good at playing rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> yeah. which is why he didn't win stage four of the Tour of Slovenia yeah. recently. I'm bloody good at rock, paper, scissors. You'd have no chance against me, Si. I would like to see you take Tade Pogacar on at rock, paper, scissors. Well, the good thing with that is that if you lose the first one, you say best of three and just carry on until you win, <laughs> don't you? Now, the fact that his team has gotten stronger over the years will make it even more difficult to beat him. But that said, UAE Team Emirates still doesn't have the strength in depth of Jumbo Visma. UAE only have one leader. Whereas Jumbo Visma have three. Wavan Arts for stages in the green jersey, plus Primoz Roglic and Jonas Vingago, runners up in 2020 and 2021, mm. respectively. Now, of the two, Roglic is obviously the rider with the best and most consistent results, but Vinegar is definitely a pretender to his throne. His second place last year was no fluke, and his recent form at the Criterium du Dauphiné suggested that his climbing is on a par with Roglic's. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how they play things tactically, isn't it? But if both of them come through the open week unscathed, fingers crossed that they do, the two-pronged attack might just be what's needed to overcome the individual might of Pogaccio. Might be. It's going to be a fascinating one to watch play out, isn't it? And the five domestiques they're taking are damn strong too. They're the strongest team, but even in a team sport, that doesn't necessarily mean they will win the race, does it? No. So Ineos Grenadiers, who won this race seven times in eight years between 2012 and 2019, now find themselves in the position of underdogs. Mm. Garrett Thomas's win at the Tour de Suisse recently showed that he's hit form at the right time, whilst Danny Martinez could well be a Grand Tour winner one day. Mm. However, the fact remains that that team has never won a stage race in which Tade Pogacar started. Good fact. Uh, so they too will have to hope that they can play the numbers game, particularly if Adam Yates has recovered quickly from COVID to be on the start line of this race. Yeah, they also have a lot of strength in depth too. So if they do happen to take yellow, they've got the power and the experience to defend mm -hmm. it. So that's the main battle, isn't it? Pogacar versus Jumbo Visma versus Ineos. But there are plenty of others who will be looking to upset them. And I think the first of those will be AG2 R's Ben O'Connor, fourth on GC last year. And while some of that was down to time he gained on a breakaway day, he was more than deserving, I felt, of that result. This year at the Dauphiné, he was the best of the rest behind the Jumbo duo on the climbs. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him finish in the top five again this time around. Yeah, meanwhile, Bora Hansgrohe have had a brilliant season, taking their first ever Grand Tour win with Jai Hindley at the Giro. The Australian isn't competing at the Tour, but all being well, Alexander Vlasov will be. Yeah, he won a stage and went into the lead of the recent Tour de Suisse, only to be unable to start the following day in that yellow jersey after testing positive for COVID-19. Hopefully, that hasn't hindered his preparation too much, because as I said, he's been flying this season with two stage race wins to his name. Yeah, and he could be a real contender if he's at 100%. Although, I have to admit, I'm not too sure how good he is on cobbles, or O'Connor for that matter. No, very true. Or Enric Mass, yeah. who will be leading Movistar's general classification ambitions. A really solid rider, 
but he's not had the smoothest of runs into this Tour de France. He crashed out of the Dauphiné, and so we don't have a really good indication as to how good his form is right now. Yeah, you're right. He's solid, isn't he? But he's not a prolific winner. Five pro wins, just one of them overall in a stage race. Mm. He will probably be up there, but unless all his rivals get blown off that bridge in Denmark, I don't <laughs> see him winning, frankly. Harsh, but maybe fair. <laughs> Not sure. Let's know in the comments below. Uh, Bahrain Victorias are another team with a couple of numbers to play. Jack Haig and Damiana Caruso will be their main leaders, but Gino Maida also proved he can string three consistent weeks together at last year's Welter. That said, I reckon all three of them would be delighted with a top five on GC at the Tour de France. They're not really expected to top the podium. No, Naira Quintana will be leading Arkea Samsi, a rider I would love to see win the Tour de France, but it doesn't look likely this year, no. given his form. But never say never for him. But perhaps you could say that time is running out um, quite quickly, as it is for riders of Israel Premier Tech too. Yes, that is true. Although both Jakob Fulsang and Mike Woods have been winning recently. True. They seem to be hitting form at the right time. Not sure about Chris Froome, obviously, but Fulsang looks to be the best bet of that team, particularly as he has proven himself on cobbles in the past, 2014 Tour de France. But neither of them will be looking forward to the time trials, which are their Achilles heel, Woods yeah. and Fulsang. Yeah, beyond that, we've got Guillaume Martin, who will climb up and slide down the general classification on a day-to-day -day basis. He'll just be hoping to reach Paris at the top of the ladder, as opposed to the bottom of the snake. Yes, yes, he will be. Uh, Oran and Chavez will lead EF Education Easy Post, whilst it's David Godou who will lead Groupama FTJ, with Thibaut Pino stating that he'll be going for the polka dot jersey and stage wins this yeah. time around. Simon Yates and Roman Bardet have also said that they'll be stage hunting as opposed to going for GC and the fact that all three of them are stage hunting will make winning stages all the more difficult. Yes. It's a funny one that isn't it? Oh no you're going for stage, why don't you go for GC? <laughs> uh, finally on the GC front Alexei Lutchenko stated at the start of the year that he's targeting a good overall result at the Tour de France but the whole Astana team have been under par this year so I'm not expecting too much from them. No just before we get on to the sprinters a final reminder that there will be a whole load of Tour de France related content on the GCN app, which is completely free to everyone. Correct. We will have an overall preview, in-depth stage previews with race maps and profiles. We'll also have start lists, results and a whole heap of other written content from beginners guys to historical pieces on certain riders. Yeah, and we'll have our usual polls and quizzes so you can get involved with your own opinions too. Right, sprinters? Yeah, let's get on to them. OK, we have to start with a man who has never even ridden the Tour de France before, let alone won a stage. Mm, Fabio Jakobsen. As we record this, he has won 10 races so far in 2022, more than any other sprinter. And I think I'm right in saying that he's only been involved in 14 bunch sprints all year. So that is quite the strike rate. Not bad. Uh, the team were forced with a difficult or faced with a difficult decision between Jakobsen and Cavendish. But there's no doubt the Dutchman has been the most consistent and reliable sprinter so far this year. Yeah, one of his main rivals will be Dylan Groenewegen of Team Bike Exchange. Now, I don't think I need to remind any of you of their history, but it is great to see them both fit and healthy and competing together on the biggest stage. It is, it? yes. I actually think Groenewegen is the fastest man in the world at the moment. He just doesn't seem to get himself into position quite as well as some of the others, but that'll be an interesting one. Uh, Caleb Ewan of Lotto Soudal will be looking to put a disappointing Giro de Italia behind him. Now there's no doubt that he's got what it takes, but he also seems to struggle to be in the right place at the right time for the sprints on occasion. Yeah, and not ride into the back of people. That too. Yeah. Uh, Jasper Philipson will be the sole sprinter for Alps and Phoenix, with Tim Merlier not taking the start this year. Before this year, Merlier certainly looked to be the faster of the two, but Philipson has stepped it up a gear this year, hasn't he? And is more than capable of a stage win on his day. I'd say so, yeah. Uh, former Green Jersey winner Sam Bennett should be on the start line for Bora Hansgrohe, but he's been struggling to get back to the form of 2020 this year, hasn't he? In fact, his teammate, Danny Van Poppel, has been getting the more consistent results when it comes to sprints this year. Yeah, Alexander Kristoff and Mass Pedersen will be looking to make their mark at the end of the tougher stages too. They might not have quite the out and out speed of some of the others, but if there's any rain and a few climbs preceding the sprint, They'll be there. Yeah, watch out for them. Uh, Brian Cocard has never won a stage of the Tour de France. I don't think he's even won a World Tour level race, I think I'm right in saying. Yeah. It's quite unlikely he'll win a stage of the Tour de France this year, but I would love to see him finally get that win. And then there's Peter Sagan and Wout van Aert. The Green Jersey King versus the Green Jersey King to be. Quite possibly, Perhaps, yes. yeah. Van Aert 
will need to be up there on the sprint days to have any hope of winning that green jersey. And he has, of course, proven he can win bunch sprints. As has Sagan. Yes. And it was great to see him win again at the recent Tour de Suisse, wasn't it? Was. it? I hope he is on good form because it'll be great for the race and for television viewers, won't it? And finally, the time trialists. Now, with a time trial on the opening day, they have the opportunity of a lifetime this year. Yeah, and if you want a big favourite, look no further than Ineos Grenadiers' Filippo Ganna. The world champion has won the vast majority of the time trials he started over the last few years. He is a beast on a bike, quite frankly, and he will desperately want to swap the rainbow stripes for a yellow jersey. Yeah, the last time he lost a time trial, incidentally, was at the UAE Tour this year, and that was where Stefan Bissiger had quite a convincing win. Now, the 13 kilometre distance in Copenhagen, I think will suit Bissiger down to the ground, and you can bet that he's been working very specifically towards this goal of the first eight, and I would not be surprised to see him win it. No, which would be just what EF education need right yes. now, wouldn't it? He can go around corners, can't he? Which is useful if there's 22 corners it is, in yeah. that prologue. Yeah, second um, a corner, 22 seconds. Quick maths. There you go. <laughs> Clever that. Uh, right, Wout van Aert is another man who could take the win on that opening day. You wouldn't put anything past him, quite frankly, while Stefan Kung will be hoping to finally get the tour stage win that he has been so close to before. Yeah, that would be good to see. It well, would, wouldn't it? Yeah. Ethan Hayter could also be close if he gets a place on Ineos' squad. And then a lot of the GC riders we mentioned before will also be right up there on that opening day too. Yep, so watch out too as well for Remy Cavagna and his quick step alpha vinyl teammate Casper Askren if he's recovered from that crash that took him out of the Tour de Suisse. Yep. So that is the GC riders and the sprinters and the time trials ticked off. But we haven't mentioned Mathieu van der Poel. No, because he's in a category all of his own, isn't he, frankly? If the Giro is anything to go by, he will give it a good go on about, what, 19 of the 21 yeah, probably, stages? Yes. Um, but you'd probably imagine that he would have his eye on the cobblestone stage Stage five, yeah. really, in particular. Few, I think Jasper Sturm, and there's quite a few people have their eye on that stage for obvious reasons. But Van der Poel literally has nothing to lose, does no. he? No GC rider in the team to work for. He can just do whatever the hell he wants, and we love him for that. Absolutely, yeah. All right, I think that's just about all of the main players. Obviously, we can't mention every single rider in the race, but it is quite the list of stars this year. It, it feels that way, doesn't it? It does feel like that, yeah, which may or may not make our predictions even more difficult. Um, so we will start with a prediction for the general classification. Pugaccia. I thought I was going to get him first. Yeah. I, I knew, thought I was going to get him first. I knew then. you thought you were going to get him first. Anyway, but he is the obvious choice isn't he, quite frankly, um, unless he has a crash or misfortune. How do you beat him? Well, we mentioned it earlier, didn't we? Rock, paper, scissors. Good point. That's how you beat him. <laughs> All right, then, what, what about without Pogaccia as an option? What is your prediction then? Roglic. Finnegal. Oh. Really? Well, yeah, I think so. At least we differ on that one. We do, do you? I yeah. just think that Vinegar, he is the pretender to the throne, isn't he? He's clearly on great form right now. And he's got that card to play, you know, he might be allowed to go up the road and UAE team Eric's got nothing to do about it. But Roglic has won Grand Tours. Yeah, yeah, true. And he is consistent and dependable. A little bit maturer, much yeah, more he, mature. Yeah, he, he does, but he does crash quite a lot, <laughs> true. doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, if everything goes smoothly, I do think you're right. I'm just not confident enough in Roglic that it will go smoothly. Okay, all right, fair dude. Green jersey. Van <laughs> Well, that's equally as obvious a pick, isn't it, yeah. as, as Pogaccia for the win. We won't go for a second place in the green jersey. No. Surely it's got to be Wout van Aert. Surely. All right, polka dot jersey. Pinot. I'll, I'll let you have that. Oh, really? If you're going for oh. Pinot, I'll go for fellow Frenchman Romain Bardet. Really? Two yes. French GC hopes from years past now gunning for polka dot jersey. Could be good, that, because if Yates is on the start line for bike exchange, and if Mike Woods is not going for GC and he also goes to the polka dot jersey competition, we could see a lot of riders fighting it out at the top of the climbs, which would yeah. be great to see. Heroic mountain stages, that's what we all like. Exactly. Uh, right, let's head over to some of our other presenters now to see how many of them haven't picked Tade Pogaccia. <laughs> I'm just on the Splugen Pass. But if I go for Tade Pogaccia, no one's going to say, oh, well predicted when he wins. So I might as well have a gamble and go for Alexander Vlasov. From a long drive to Scotland, I think Pogaccia's going to win the Tour de France. Boring. Actually, boring, no, okay, right. <laughs> Matthew van der Poel, go on. So now it's the German turn for the Tour de France prediction. Who's going to win? Me. The yellow jersey. <laughs> Who will it be? Huh? Richie. 
Yeah? You? Yeah. No, no, it, it won't be me. But uh, as usual on the German channel, I'm going with my favorite by heart, and this is uh, G. Jaron Thomas. So he will win the tour. Uh, you have to think with the head. So I go for a guy who rides a Colnago, Tadej Pogacar. Hi, everyone. To be fully honest, I don't see anyone able to beat Tadej Pogacar this year again at the Tour de France. But I have a dream that probably will stay as a dream is to see Julien Lafilippe the first week take a long breakaway with 10 minutes ahead on the branch and keep the yellow jersey until the end this time, being the first Frenchman to win the Tour de France after a long time and Bernardo. Let's see. Our prediction for uh, Tour de France, uh, Tadip Pogacar is uh, too easy to say. Yeah, he's the favorite number one, of course. I will watch uh, particularly the Jumbo Visma team not only Roglic, but also Vingegaard could be, yeah, could be the leader of this team, maybe. I want to say Roglic. Roglic uh, could make the masterpiece. Just for not see Pogacar. Exactly, because yeah, exactly. It's too easy. Fairly unanimous, then. Understandably so. Uh, yes, but anything can happen. This is the Tour de France after all. Uh, let us know who your favourite is and why in the comments section down below. Right, that is pretty much all for this year's Tour de France preview show here on GCN. We hope you can join us for our live coverage of the race, which, as I remind you, it starts on Friday. Yeah, thank you very much for watching. And if you've enjoyed it, please give the thumbs up button a click down below. And also, get involved in the predictions in the comments.